We are going to be talking about Advent joy today as we can continue our series uh, on Advent. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2, specifically the, the two verses that were read uh, by faith. Well, it was read by faith and Lauren narrated sort of. Matthew chapter 2, 10 to uh, 11. And uh, let me just get you to go ahead and stand. We're going to read these again together. And I want you to pay close attention to the phrase, rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So Matthew chapter 2, 10 and 11. If you're our guest, we say this phrase, the very words at the end of the main text reading, just to distinguish God's word from uh, my own. So here's what the scripture says in verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You can be seated. <clears throat> Joy is an interesting concept. Uh, in fact, I think... I think as a society, we sort of struggle with joy. I think even I struggle with joy uh, from, from time to time. I think we all have struggles in this category. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that we get happiness and joy confused. Uh, happiness, just like Lauren said a minute ago, happiness is based on happenstance or our circumstance. You know, happiness is always like right around the corner. Have you ever noticed that? Like, once you get something and it makes you happy for a minute, there has to be something else circumstantially, either in your relationship or something that you get or position in life. Or, but happiness is sort of always around the corner. It's like, it's like the next thing. How many of you have an iPhone? Anybody? Any of you are Android people in the rooms, right? Okay. It's weirdos. I'm just kidding. Um, so... Here's the thing. This is an iPhone 8. Obviously, I am not. I, I, here's what I care about about my iPhone. It fits in my pocket. That's why I have an 8. I don't care how many cameras or any, any of that kind of stuff. But a lot of people, a lot of people want to have the latest and greatest iPhone 8. Like pre-COVID, if you showed up at an Apple store when they were releasing this iPhone, you have to get in line. People get trampled. You see it on the news trying to get in line for the new iPhone. You know, some of you may have asked uh, for one for Christmas, for all I know. Maybe getting the iPhone 12 mini or max or whatever it is. And I got to tell you, like in January, as soon as you get that at Christmas, January, they're going to come out with the, the 13. They probably won't call it the 13 because that's unlucky. I don't know what they'll, they'll call it, but they're going to come out with the next one and they're going to tell you, you have this brand new iPhone. They're going to tell you if you get this one, you'll be happier e with this one even more than you're happier with that right? Now, iPhones don't do it for everybody, but something does, right? Circumstances, what we get, what we have, what, what we experience in life, it sort of drives happiness. But joy is not like that. Joy is sort of above our circumstances. It, it doesn't matter if if you're on a high and, and everything's going great or you're in this deep valley and everything's going terrible or somewhere in between, joy is sourced in Jesus, it doesn't come from what you get. It's not around the corner. If you have a relationship with Jesus, it's always, no matter if you're going through that moment where you think, this is never going to end, the suffering is never going to end, or whether you're, everything's going great. Joy, its source, is in G Jesus. And like I said, if I'm honest, I struggle with joy, and I think it's because sometimes I do confuse joy with happiness. Joy comes from rich things like belief in Jesus the King, like, like he's the Savior. He really saved me from my sins, and because of that, I'm forgiven. Like he's the great promise keeper, and because of that, I, I know that he's going to restore all things no matter how bad they are. I know that he calls himself a shepherd. He's going to shepherd me through the day no matter how good or bad it is. Joy comes from walking with him daily, from hearing him, obeying him, coming into his presence, and, uh, and, and maybe that that's, you understand that completely. And maybe that sounds like a foreign concept right now to uh, many of you. And so what I want to do is take a look at these wise men for just a minute 
and contextually understand this passage that we just read, Matthew chapter 2, 10 to 11. It, it comes in a greater passage, Matthew 2. You know, this, this verse is, is right in the middle of, of just a, a greater passage that shows that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, just like it was prophesied in the book of Micah, some 800 years before Jesus was born. And, and we get the entrance of these magi, these magi or wise men. <clears throat> By the way, let me just like dispel that, that thought that there were three of them. We have no idea how many there are, but, but <clears throat> what we sing becomes reality for us, right? Or what we see in the nativity scene becomes reality for us. We don't know how many there were. We do know they were from the East. They were either from Persia or, or Babylon uh, for certain. And be, they were not, they weren't Christians. Uh, they were pagan. They, they, did not necessarily consider themselves part of this great Christian story that we look back at and and see now. But what they were doing, because this is what these guys were, they were astrologers. So they looked at the stars for signs in the stars. They looked at history and all kinds, not just the Hebrew Bible, but all kinds of, of antiquated literature now. And, and they, they studied and they paid attention to what was going on in the world today. They dabbled in magic. Uh, So these guys were not, these were not Christians. Uh, They show up though, because they're following a star. And the question becomes like, why in the world, why do they even know about this star? You ever wondered that? Like, how do these guys from the East know about this star? Because we don't get any, any clarity on that. But I think, we, I think we do. I think we have an answer. It's a theory. It's a theory of mine, but I think it's really important to, to think about. The, the book of Numbers tells us uh, in, in, the, in the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, that uh, we should be looking for a, a ruler of Israel that will be raised and, uh, with a scepter and will be under a star. It's in the Torah, the Hebrew Bible. Now, if you, if you if put yourself in Bethlehem in the first century, if you rewind from there in history to the time of the Babylonians and the Babylonian exile and this king named Nebuchadnezzar. There was a Jewish guy, Hebrew guy, who ended up there in the exile. His name was Daniel. Daniel became, to make a long story short, became the leader of all of the wise men, of all of the magi in Nebuchadnezzar's court because he was able to foretell dreams that God showed him. Daniel, I believe, Daniel from the book of Numbers tells the wise men and they tell it generationally, be watching for this star because there's going to be a great king that comes out of Israel. And when it happens, everything is going to change. And so they pass this from generation to generation. They've been watching for the star and now they come, they come all the way to Jerusalem. It says that when they see the star that they, they had, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy because they had so much anticipation from generation the generation waiting for it. So when they actually saw it and they began to move toward it and came to Jerusalem, they had all this joy, even though they're pagan. They meet a guy named Herod. They go to King Herod. Herod is a megalomaniac, right? So Herod is the kind of guy, like he's an incredible builder, incredible architect. He's got like eight or nine palaces all over the the Middle East. Some of you you might have heard of like Masada uh, or uh, the one that's in Jerusalem, Herod's palace in Jerusalem. But there are like eight other ones and they're incredible. And you wouldn't, you won't even believe it if you see it. I mean, spas and all kinds of stuff in, the, in these palaces, amazing palaces. The incredible builder, he's got an incredible amount of money, maybe the wealthiest man in that region at the time. Uh, incredible power because he's in cahoots with Rome. So he, he's actually not, he, he's actually an Edomite, which should disqualify him for being a king of Israel, but he was raised by a Jewish parent. And so he's got kind of both things going on and Rome pulls him into that. He, uh, he's their, their man. And so he's, he calls himself the king of Israel. The Magi show up and they ask him, hey, can you tell us where it is that the king of Israel will be born? We saw this star. Now, if you're a megalomaniac who thinks you're the king of Israel and someone asks you where the king of Israel will be born, Instantly, you're highly offended. And so he crafts this plan, and the plan is this. Oh, I know the prophecy is Micah. 
Chapter five tells us he's gonna be born in Bethlehem, which is merely five miles from where we're standing. And so uh, you go find him. And when you find him, you come back and tell me because I wanna worship him too. Not really. What we find is that what he wants to do is kill him, right? Because he's the king of Israel. He doesn't want any competition and a new guy that's got his own star and all that kind of stuff. And so this is his plan. Now the Magi go, they go to Bethlehem. They find Jesus uh, in the house with his parents. And uh, again, another like misconception is people make him show up at the cave where he was born because of the nativity sets. But the text tells us he's actually in a house some months, maybe a year or two later. We don't know exactly, but they show up. He's in the house and uh, they worship him. They give him their best. In Matthew chapter two, verse 10, it says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So if these pagans can be in the presence of Jesus and experience such great joy, my question is, and my observations today are surrounding this text, what about me and you, people who follow Jesus, about what about Jesus, joy, and me, and you? And I just want to make four observations here that I think apply to us. Because so many people say like, well, if I, if I saw a star like that, I'd, I'd believe. If I saw the Red Sea parted, you know, I, I'd believe if I saw miraculous things like that. If I saw a star like the, the, the magic I did or whatever. And here's the first observation. Is that I'll just phrase it this way. We can see stars too. We can see stars too. It's not just wise men from the East. It's not just magi from the East. They're not the only ones who can see signs from God. We can see stars too, and they're all around us. Signs given, prophecy fulfilled, promises yet to be fulfilled that will be. We have things just as great as that star that point to Jesus. Now, let me explain that to you. First, there's this category of signs already given to us. I mentioned this a moment ago in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, 17 and 18. Moses, the writer of this book, says, speaking of the future, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. So there's one coming that's not yet from the writer's perspective, the book of Numbers, and he's not near. The time gap is, is far. A star shall come out of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. He's the the father of Israel. A star shall come out of Jacob and, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. Now remember I told you that Herod is an Edomite. So he also knows this scripture. He knows that Edom will be possessed by one that comes out of Jacob under a star with a scepter. This is a sign given. So when we see in the Bible a sign, this is, a, this, this is the same Bible that Daniel had. This is the same verse I believe that he shared with the wise men in the East and he trained them on. It's why they're watching for the star. It's the same verse that Herod knows when they show up. When the wise men show up and point to the star, it's fulfilling all of this. And Jesus is literally there, a king that rises out of Jacob and that will dispossess Edom and Seir and all these evil nations. Israel is doing value. So these are signs given. Now, it's not the only one. I mean, the Bible gives us all kinds of signs. Uh, Just think about this, just prophecy fulfilled. So back to just simple, Micah chapter five, verse two. It's also quoted here in Matthew chapter two, which is our our reading for the day. Micah 5, two, written 800 years before the birth of Jesus, says, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. So Micah was saying 800 years before Jesus was born, he prophesied that the savior would be born, the one that Isaiah talked about, the one that was written about in the book of Numbers, he would be born, in Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem, I don't know what you think about first century Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a no-name town. It's 600 to 2,000 people somewhere in there. It's small. It's a shepherding town. Nothing to it. 
And yet it's prophesied in this little speck of dirt in the Judean wilderness. This is where the Messiah will be born. Now we know the Messiah was born there. We live this side of all of that. The Messiah was born there. Prophecy was fulfilled, but it's not the only prophecy that was fulfilled. We can see Jesus dying on a cross to save us from our sins, to appease the wrath of God as prophecy fulfilled. We can see his resurrection from the grave as prophecy fulfilled, his ascension to heaven. Uh, It's a sign, a prophecy fulfilled, the existence of the church today, prophecy fulfilled. And there's more prophecy yet to be fulfilled in the Bible that's already been fulfilled. So if you believe in a Messiah born of a virgin that was born in Bethlehem, that died on a cross to save you from your sins, that rose again, defeating the penalty of sin and death, that ascended to heaven, then you also should believe he's coming back again, according to the scriptures. You should also believe that he's restoring all things, that he's going to fulfill promises that he made in the past that are right here in the scripture, that their fulfillment is in the future. This brings us joy as followers of Jesus. This supersedes whether you get the next iPhone or the dog you wanted, or your relationship is going well, or things are good in life with your kids or bad or whatever. This supersedes all that because we have prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16 This is uh, speaking of our future. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. So again, he's saying, I am the one that's fulfilled all these prophecy. Let me tell you about your future. Your future goes like this, because of my work on the cross, because of who I am as King Jesus, you will have treasures in heaven. You will have an inheritance that is eternal. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem. Um, This old earth is going to pass away. There will be no more sin in the new heaven and the new earth because it will all have been paid for. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be there, but Jesus died on a cross, saved me from my sin. Uh, the mercy and grace that I received, the mercy is I'm, I'm free from sin. The grace is he made me his son. He changed me, gave me a new identity. Now I get to go be with him in the future forever and ever. He's restoring all things, the scripture says. I don't like the brokenness that we experience in the world now. I don't like the effects of sin in the world right now, but we're saved from it and is restoring everything uh, to, so, so that we will experience this new heaven and new earth. He is the bright and morning star. All I'm saying to you is through signs, through, that, that have been fulfilled, through prophecy that's been fulfilled, that pr- through promises that have yet to be fulfilled. We, uh, through the Bible, we can see stars too. We see all these things. Pay attention. Look for them like the Magi were looking for that star. They're all in here and we can see them and have joy in the fact that they have been and will be fulfilled. We should be aware and watching daily. Now, here's my second observation is that We can experience joy from being with Jesus. Um, The joy, the the happiness of of owning something or or a, a good experience, a good moment, like it wears off. But joy that we get from being with Jesus is consistent. It's sustaining. Now, here's what I don't mean. You know how uh, church people like to fake joy, right? Did you know that? Like, oh, yeah, I'm good. It's all good. It's really not all good. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about joy that depends on how you feel. I'm talking about joy that is sourced in Jesus that you can have. It's different. And so when we can, we, this is the second observation, we can experience joy from being with Jesus. Now, narrative, like we're reading today, is never prescriptive. It doesn't mean because the wise men did this, you should do this. It's not prescriptive. However, I learned some things from this narrative that are meaningful for our life. The wise men go into the house where Jesus and Mary and Joseph are residing. They fall on their knees and worship him. These pagans give him as this king that they've been looking for, that's been prophesied, that has the star. They give him their treasures. I often consider this when I think about a relationship with Jesus the king. What a joy to be in his presence. They had exceedingly, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. What a joy to be in his presence, to have an intimate relationship with him. You can find yourself hitting your knees in worship to him and giving him the best of all 
that you have. And according to the scriptures, if you're in Christ, you have access to him all the time, anytime. You can walk into his presence. We experience joy from being with Jesus. Now, here's the third observation I would make. According to the scripture, we should recognize Satan is a joy robber. He's an enemy that's working to rob joy. Now, in this narrative that we have, he's working through Herod. Like Herod is his pawn. Herod wants to kill Jesus. He's he's a megalomaniac. He has power. He doesn't want to lose power. He sees Jesus as highly uh, not uh, unfavorable for him politically because now these 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 stellar wise men are coming from the east and looking for another king of the Jews. So he he plots to have him killed. Now, there's other other prophecy in the scripture that says there was weeping in the land of Ramah. That's because the infants to two-year-old were killed trying to kill Jesus because of Herod's edict, because of his order, because he, he, he did not want to be trumped as the king. See, and here's the deal. Satan often tries to rob joy. That this is the best thing that ever happened that the Messiah was born. And yet he wants to rob the joy. He wants to squelch it. John chapter 10, verse 10, it tells us the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, I came that, that they may have life and have it abundantly. But Satan, like his, the way he works is to, to steal, to rob joy. He's gonna do it with lies. He's gonna tell you lies, just like Herod did. Hey, Go to Bethlehem. Come back to me. Tell me where where he is. I want to worship him too. That's a lie. You know, and this is how Satan works. And he's going to whisper lies into your ear. He does not want you to have joy. He wants you to believe that there is no hope, that there is no reason to have joy. He wants you to believe that your suffering doesn't end and God can't end it. He wants you to believe that the pain is too much. He wants you to believe that the difficulty is too much. He wants you to believe that you you don't have enough compared to somebody else or you haven't done enough in life or whatever those things are. The enemy, he wants to rob joy from you and he will lie to you. He will tell you God is not as good as he said he is. Jesus didn't really die on a cross to save you from your sins. How could he love you like that? Can you imagine this? That Jesus, he prays in John 17 for a lot of things, but one of the things he prays for is for you and for me, those who have yet to hear, that when we hear, we would come to him and we would be sons and daughters of God. Can you imagine this? You know your life. I know my life. You know, if, if my life played out before, if, if you knew every detail of my life, you would say to yourself, I don't want him to be my pastor. It's that way. With you too, if you would think of God, if he knew every detail of my life, he would not love me like that. He can't love me. How could he love me? If the scripture is crystal clear that for everything I've ever done, for everything that you've ever done that was against the very character and nature of God, when we come to him in repentance, confess to him, he forgives us of sin and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. That is the sovereign king of the universe saying, you're pardoned, you're forgiven. And not only that, come to me. I want to be your dad. I want to be your father and you be my son. You be my daughter. There's no greater joy than that. To be free from your sin, to lay down the burden of guilt and shame and to be able to run into the lap of the father. I remember when my kids were really little, yeah, a lot of you have probably done this before. Like I had this game where I would throw them up in the air and they would, I mean, I would see how high I could get them and their arms and their legs would be flailing, but they, would be, they were never scared. They were always just giggling so loud. Why? They're just in the presence of their father. It seems crazy. They're flying through the air, but they know what? Daddy's going to catch them. I'm not going to drop you on your head. If I do, mama's going to kill me right? This is so much joy. And we can have that, but Satan, he just wants to rob it from you. He just wants you to say, your daddy is not that good, uh, but, but he is, but he is. So here's the fourth observation. And that's this, that 
We do struggle with joy, but joy struggles are overcome in the presence of Emmanuel. Now, it's kind of a repeat of what I said earlier, but I want to expound just a little bit. So we're in a moment in history that reminds me of the times of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And Jerusalem was not good. Israel was not good during those times. Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 24, 11, speaking of, uh, of Israel and Jerusalem, there's an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All that means is like, when economy is good in Israel, man, the wine abounds. But when the economy is bad, there's a lack of wine. So we know there's an outcry in the streets because the economy is terrible. All joy has grown dark. The gladness of the earth is banished. This is where, uh, this is Isaiah writing, honestly, this is a prophet of God saying, this stinks. I've heard people say stuff like that about these days. You know, Jeremiah said something very similar. Jeremiah chapter eight, verse 18, my joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. It kind of, I've been there. It, it kind of brings me uh, hope that these great prophets of God also had moments where they felt like my heart is sick within me. My joy is gone. My grief is overwhelming. David has these things. Jesus cries out in anguish. I mean, the, all this is common to humanity, but the difference is, I mean, you think about this, you think, okay, we're in a pandemic. How weird is this thing? How weird is it? It's weird on every angle and it's global. It's not just affecting us, it's affecting the entire globe. I mean, the, the, the economy is in a downturn everywhere because of this thing. People are sick and dying everywhere because of this thing. We have to do all kinds of weird things and have weird guidelines and live differently. It's just weird. There's not a lot of joy in it at all. In the midst of that and everything else, just you take the pandemic away, your life by itself is probably a little crazy. You know, and then just the national craziness and all uh, in the middle of all of this, what are we supposed to do about our joy? And the thing is, here's the thing. What are you supposed to do about that? I mean, Isaiah, when there's no, no economy, like uh, Jeremiah, like grief overwhelms me and everything. What are you going to do? Well, there's not a lot you can do. You realize that, right? There's not a lot you can do about the pandemic. You just keep taking steps forward each and every day. There's not a lot you can do about the global situation, Right? But God can. And this is what he did in the days of Isaiah and Jeremiah. God, it says that he gave them hope and they found joy in the idea, the understanding biblically that God was going to come near, that he was going to bless them with his presence. Listen to Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. Therefore, speaking of a new day that will come, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. So we get this in Isaiah chapter 7, 14, 900 years before the birth of Christ. The sign is going to be a virgin is going to conceive and bear a son. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. So this is the hope. They're hoping in one that's going to be born in Bethlehem, according to Micah, one that would be born of a virgin, which would be the first time ever and last time ever. And one that would be very specific to the people of Israel and his lineage. That's the sign. That's the hope. That's our joy. Everything's going to change because God is going to come near. Paul said this in Romans chapter 5, 15 to 13. You think about Paul. <laughs> Paul is like, <clears throat> he, he, he's a brilliant scholar and um, an amazing church planter. And, and he wrote many of our books of the, the New Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times he's suffering. He's got broken bones for the cause of Christ. He's in jail for the cause of Christ. He's, he's making a defense of himself before Rome and all these Roman officials because of Christ and in Jerusalem and in Caesarea and all these places. He's constantly in hardship. He's shipwrecked. I mean, this guy's life is suffering. And he tells the church at Rome this, and I want you to hear this today. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. 
Now, here's the thing. That joy that comes from the God of hope comes from being in his presence and believing him, believing his truth over the enemy's lies. Understanding, I'm forgiven of my sin. Man, if you grew up in church, that you can become so inoculated to that that you don't even feel it anymore. You've forgiven of your sin in Christ. You're, you're not going to go to hell. <laughs> what mercy. That, that alone brings me joy. I mean, it could be really bad. I, I have thought this to myself many times. This is terrible. What I'm going through right now is terrible, but at least I'm not going to hell. This is joy. One little, ang- you know. But not just that. That, did, that God would treat me as his son or you as his daughter. That he says, you know, you, you, I've given you a new identity. Now I'm God's kid. Are you kidding me? The sovereign king of the universe in the line of Abraham and Jesus. Brian, I have a Celtic name, not a Jewish name. You changed me. And now the scripture says I have an inheritance. One, he made me righteous. I would not be righteous on my own. But the way that God views me, I'm righteous because Jesus made me that way by his blood. So now my standing with God, not only am I not going to hell, but now in standing with God, I come before the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to say, you're righteous, not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did. I just believed. And he's, and he's going to treat me like his son, like the prodigal son tr- treated his son put a ring on his finger and new shoes on his feet, new robe on his back, killed the fattened calf and said, let's have a party. I have so much joy in that. I don't care if we're in a pandemic. I don't care if I have to wear a mask. I don't care about any of it. When I think about that, it's eternal. It's bigger. It's bigger than this. You know? And then I just think about this. The scripture says we're going to rule and reign with him. New Jerusalem. Not only am am I I his son, but I get a position of leadership, of servanthood in the kingdom of God. So much joy. So much joy. I don't always feel happiness. Sometimes I feel depressed. Sometimes I feel anxious, all that. But when I'm in those moments, I look back at these things and I think, oh my goodness. And it gives me hope. It gives me joy. So may, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing. I hope that you believe him and you let your belief trump what you feel. What you feel <clears throat> will lead you to happiness or depression. What you think, even when you're depressed, even when you're anxious, even when you're happy, what you think about Jesus will lead you to the source of joy, what you believe. You know, I was listening, I saw, I think it was a meme I saw online the other day, and uh, it was really funny to me because I was, I was kind of complaining that I had like five Zoom meetings in the same day. Anybody done that? Like where you have like, boom, 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 boom. Is this terrible? I hate it. I don't want to ever have a Zoom meeting again. I will, but I don't want to, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> I hate it, but this little meme was hilarious. It was like, you know, when we get to heaven and the disciples that were crucified, beaten, um, all those things for the cause of Christ, when they, it was written toward pastors. When, when they, they hear us complaining, yeah, like we had these awful Zoom meetings. It was, it was such a, it was so bad, so, so rough. Uh, they're not going to want to hear that. <laughs> it was like from one pastor to another. I was like, yep, you're right. I need, to, I need to quit complaining and remember, Jesus said, take up his cross, deny yourself, follow me. And somehow in that, I'm going to have joy, right? So Advent joy, yeah, we're waiting on the coming of the Messiah. We're going to celebrate his birth on Christmas Eve. We're going to talk about his love and celebrate his birth Christmas Day. And Advent for this, this season will be over, but we're not just waiting on the birth of Christ to celebrate on December 25th. We're waiting for the return of Christ. Like just like he came and was born in Bethlehem, scripture says the skies will split. The Mount of Olives in Jerusalem will split. Living water will go from east to west. He'll be like one riding a white horse coming like the son of man. He has a sword. He doesn't come like a lamb this time to get crucified. He comes victoriously and he restores all things. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. No more tears, no more crying, no more pain. Now I can't wait, honestly. And when you're suffering and you think it's not going to end or it's too difficult, too hard, just remember, 
Remember all these things. Do like Mary did, ponder them in your heart, cherish them in your heart. Do like the wise men did, chase the stars. Look at them, the signs, the prophecies, the promises yet to come. And know that you got more than than what your feet are experiencing on this planet right now coming to you in Jesus. And it it brings so much joy. And the greatest joy would be in his presence. The greatest joy would be in his presence. It says, in my house, in my father's house are many rooms. And he's going to prepare a place for us. Book of John. So I can't imagine, I, I talk to Jesus every day. I read his word like this. I, I love hearing from Jesus this way and I love praying and knowing that he hears me and that I can hear him by his spirit. But I cannot wait to do this. I can't wait. So much joy in that. It's coming. It's coming. That's Advent joy. Would you bow your head, close your eyes and just ask the Lord to speak to you. going to guide you through prayer for a moment. So why don't you begin by just telling Jesus in prayer all the things that you feel like are going on that maybe rob your joy. And just tell him those things. And now ask him, just like Paul said, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace that comes in believing. Ask him to help you believe and to fill you with joy and peace. greatest joy I've ever experienced in my life, and I think it would be for you too, is when you come to Christ, you finally get to that point where you, you realize, like, I really, I, I'm a sinner in need of rescue, in need of a Savior. And you bow and you pray and you just, I, you just say to him, I, I believe that you died on the cross to save me from my sins. I, I believe you are who you said you are and you can do what you said you can do. I believe you rose again. Forgive me of my sin. Be Lord of my life. And the scripture says that when you pray a prayer like that, and you come to Jesus, that he saves you instantly. That there's a, it, the, uh, the scripture describes a party in heaven because one lost soul came to him. And what I experienced in that moment for me was that you lay your sin burden down. And, and when you come out of that prayer and begin walking with Jesus, you walk in freedom. You're lighter. You're not held down by shame and guilt, but you're held up by the joy of Jesus. So maybe you need to take that step today. Maybe you just need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Scripture says you'll be saved in that moment. I think that'll be the beginning of your journey in real joy. So if that's you, you you just take that step privately in prayer right where you're at. Just pray and ask him to forgive you. Come into your life and be Lord of your life. Father, we love you. There's none like you. We bless your name. Fill us with joy and peace, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.